Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Outen, and I am the Storbel Programs Manager for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, and I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's virtual author's talk. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation of the achievement of American independence by supporting advanced study, exhibitions, and other historical programs, advocating preservation, and providing resources to classrooms. Since 1938, the Society of the Cincinnati has done this work from its headquarters, Anderson House, a National Historic Landmark finished in 1905 as the winter residence of Lars and Isabel Anderson in Washington, DC. Tonight's author's talk features Dr. Kylie Holbert, who will discuss her new book, The Untold War at Sea, America's Revolutionary Privateers. Action at Sea played a critical role in European and Anglo-American conflicts throughout the 18th century. Yet the oft-told narrative of the American Revolution tends to focus on battles on American soil or the debates and decisions of the Continental Congress. The Untold War at Sea is the first book to place American privateers and their experiences during the War for Independence front and center. It tells the story of privateers at home and abroad while chronicling their experiences, engagements, cruises, and court cases. This study reconsiders the role of privateers and challenges the conventional view of privateers as opportunists motivated by profit. Despite their controversial tactics, Holbert argues that privateers merit a place alongside Minutemen and Continental soldiers and sailors as important contributors to American independence. Kylie Holbert is a historian of early America with interests in war and society, maritime history, and social history. She is currently a visiting instructor at Hampton Sydney College in Virginia and was formerly an assistant professor of colonial American history at Texas A&M University, Kingsville. Professor Holbert earned a PhD in history from the University of Georgia in 2015 and is also the author of History, Sir, Will Tell Lies as Usual, Founders, Patriots, and the War for Independence on Film, a chapter of Martial Culture, Silver Screen, published in 2020. Now, before I turn things over to Dr. Holbert, a few housekeeping items are in order. Following this evening's talk, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit questions for Dr. Holbert using the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen. Should you have any technical related questions or comments, those can be submitted using the chat function. And one of our staff members will be monitoring that and they will do their best to assist you. Now, without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Kylie Holbert. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That's a wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, thank you all for joining me this evening. Tonight, we're going to talk about my new book, uh, The Untold War at Sea, America's Revolutionary Privateers. So if you do have que questions, please do feel free to submit them uh, while the talk is ongoing. I'm, I'm looking forward to the Q&A afterwards and uh, let's get started. So Mansell Alcock was an owner and outfitter of privateers. He was also a man struggling with his conscience. This had not been the case early in the American Revolution when Alcock was a warm advocate for privateering. He had personally witnessed the positive effects of the enterprise, the prizes, goods, and money brought into American maritime ports and towns. The sea was a way of life in Alcock's home colony of Massachusetts, and he continued fully in that lifestyle when war broke out. But by spring of 1778, recent events and reports of unacceptable privateer actions from a fellow Salem privateer captain and ship owner caused Alcock to doubt his involvement. He became almost a convert to the interests of the army and believed I should always have been so. The army needed men, men that privateers eagerly took without a second thought. Privateers could be unpredictable and act in unlawful ways, taking neutral vessels or even those owned by fellow Americans. Alcock admitted that he did not realize the threat privateers posed. I had such a high opinion of our virtue and our strength, he wrote, that I only looked on privateering as the exuberance of both. However, he had seen the error of his ways, I find myself mistaken, Alcock admitted, stand rectified in my opinion and shall act accordingly. Though I can't entirely give up privateering as it's confined, confined but to few states. Even though Alcock recognized his, its faults, he also realized the profits he would forfeit 
if he quit the privateering business altogether. Such was the dilemma that many Americans faced during the revolution. To support privateering was to support what many viewed as a legalized form of piracy. To give up the venture was to relinquish any potential prizes and prisoners that might come from numerous cruises. Privateers occupied this gray area during the revolution and despite their efforts on behalf of the colonies, they were later whitewashed by politically motivated men. Men like Alcock, who ultimately decided that privateering, while effective, was not a pastime of gentlemen. The American Revolution was and continues to be a critical moment in the history of the United States. Both historians and popular authors alike have written an extensive, extensive, if you've ever been to the shelves of Barnes and Noble or Googled it or gone onto Amazon, uh, corpus concerning the conflict that led to the founding of the American nation. In terms of actions on the water, the current trend in scholarship focuses on the role of the young Continental Navy, led by the likes of Isaac Hopkins and John Paul Jones. But very little appears in print academic or mainstream regarding the operations of ocean faring colonists who took to the high seas to protect their economic and political interests, to harass the British, to make a profit and to influence the outcome of the war. My book, The Untold War at Sea, America's Revolutionary Privateers, fills part of this hole in the narrative and scholarship. Privateers served an important function during the war. While the Continental Navy struggled to gain its footing, privateers almost immediately took the war to the British Navy at sea. Their efforts clearly made an impact not only upon British sailors and troops, but in the arena of public opinion in England as well. Their wartime experiences differed from the, their continental counterparts, both on land and at sea. Privateers ranged far from the familiar, hoping for a fruitful prize, while captured continental troops and sailors could hope for a prisoner exchange, privateers were frequently viewed as pirates by the British, unworthy of any such trade. I argue the revolution of privateers was not the revolution so often touted in our history textbooks. Their revolutionary experiences included a far greater geographical scope, one which expands our understanding of the conflict into the Atlantic world. Some heeded the calling of the sea for patriotic aims, but truthfully, right, there were also those American pri privateers who were highly motivated by profit. These private enterprises were authorized by commissions granted by the Continental Congress. So this is an example of one such commission. You'll see it's a blank commission. Uh, Congress would send these out uh, to local colonial and later state governments. Uh, and those who wanted to outfit a privateer venture would have to uh, submit all the required information. So the name of the vessel, the commander, uh, its tons, the ownership, how many carriage guns it had, how many number of men, um, how it had been outfitted. And they'd also have to put up a, a bond or assurance uh, in order to be granted a, a commission. So these were issued by the Continental Congress, but nothing was owed to that governing body upon privateers return to port. So Contin the Continental Congress gave commissions, right, legalized privateering, but privateers didn't have to return anything to the Congress uh, in exchange for that commission. So whatever privateers brought in, whatever prizes they brought in, uh, were oftentimes for the benefit of the owners, outfitters, and sailors on the privateer vessel itself. While patriotism and pride supposedly inspired troops of the Continental Army, the nature of privateering made it the antithesis to Republican virtue. The ultimate goal of their ventures was to seize as many vessels as possible and return home with a profitable prize. So it, privateering was about seizing prizes. It's, it's not just about defeating the enemy, it's ab about taking something for profit, a prize, a, a vessel. They were entrepreneurs and investors exploiting the chaos of war. And as Mansell Alcock came to realize, 
Though privateers aided the cause, they often hurt it with their endeavors as well. So what I'd like to do today is give you a glimpse into the actions and efforts of privateers. We don't have time to cover every aspect of their experiences, uh, but perhaps we can better understand what it is privateers did and how they fought for prizes not only at sea, but on back on land as well. Now, before we move ahead, we should define our terms. Uh, because oftentimes there is some confusion between privateers and pirates, and they are not the same. They are not. So to, to call privateers pirates, that's only what the British called them because the British didn't want to recognize them, but they're really not the same. Uh, historians define privateers as state or government sanctioned merchants specifically outfitted to engage and attack enemy shipping. Pirates, on the other hand, were illegal sea raiders operating outside of any government, men motivated purely by self-interest and profit. Privateers were supposed to be patriotic and beholden uh, and loyal to their commissioner, while pirates were beholden to no one but themselves. Privateers had to bring their prize into port and present their case to an admiralty court. Pirates took what they pleased. Privateers were often converted merchants who operated in times of war and necessity. Piracy was a way of life during war and peace. At least these are the hard and fast definitions as they exist in theory. In practice, the difference between these groups was frequently more complex and obviously had an impact on the perception and legacy of privateers as we're going to see. The voyage of a privateer vessel from port to port, sailing upon the waters, day-to-day -day occurrences, chasing ships and being chased by ships, battles and engagements, injuries and deaths, and prisoner of war experiences tell only part of the story of a privateer's overall experience. And those are covered in the book in the first like three chapters or so. Uh, the other half of the story, that is what happened once the prize was taken into court and brought before a court of admiralty could be just as perilous, uncertain, and complicated as the endeavor to capture an enemy vessel. And this is the part I'd like to focus on today. Privateers, regardless of their port of call, so regardless of where they set sail from and regardless of where they returned home to in the colonies, oftentimes found themselves entangled in the court system. As per their instructions, and again, these are instructions that were written uh, and disseminated by the Continental Congress, uh, given to any commander uh, of private ships or vessels of war, right, which were granted commissions or letters of mark. So per these instructions, privateers had to present their potential prizes at an admiralty court. The court situation present the court system presented a situation ripe for public opinion to fall against the wartime practices of privateers and their post-war legacies. The Continental Congress and state governments commissioned, ordered, and encouraged privateers to capture enemy vessels on the promise of receiving a financial incentive for the taken prize. Yet when privateers returned their captured vessel to port, a convoluted system of claims awaited them. Privateers were forced to publicly and legally justify their actions. Actions that had been commissioned, right? And supported by Congress in the first place. So Congress supports them, Congress legalizes them, Congress says, yes, go out and do this, here are your instructions. But then when privateers return to port, they're not always given that same support from Congress or from the colonial governments that have outfitted them or supported them. Whether as claimant or defendant, these seafaring men returned home, not to shouts and cheers and huzzahs, uh, but to struggles over property captured and prizes in dispute. It was these disputes, which could last months or even years, that often colored the public's perceptions of privateers. In commonly claiming a prize, privateers opened themselves to judgment and scrutiny. 
privateers inherently found themselves in the public eye as they fought for their due. So today I would like to illustrate this struggle by telling you the story of one particular privateer and the efforts of the captain, crew, and owner to gain legal rights over its prize. So on October 29th, 1776, the sloop Montgomery, commanded by Captain Thomas Ruttenberg, captured the schooner Frank, commanded by Sylvanus Waterman, during the latter vessel's return journey uh, to Jamaica. Ruttenberg and his privateer crew carried their prize into the port of Providence, Rhode Island, where they brought suit in the Court of Justice for the trial of prize causes in and throughout the state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations in America. Ruttenberg claimed that the Frank was employed in carrying supplies to the enemies of the said United States, contrary to the resolves of Congress, the laws of the state, and the laws of nations. He asked Judge John Foster to grant the Frank as a lawful prize to the Montgomery. So Montgomery captures the Frank and Ruttenberg brings it into port in Providence, Rhode Island. They take it to court and Ruttenberg says, I would like the court to uh, declare this to be a legal prize, basically so that he can take the contents of the cargo uh, and either sell the ship or use the ship, um, he and the other owners and outfitters, uh, and divide the shares among his crew. Matters were quickly complicated when a woman named Mary Alsop entered the picture. Mary Alsop was the widow of Richard Alsop, owner of the Frank. As administrator of her husband's estate, Alsop claimed that the Frank was never owned by subjects of the King of Great Britain, nor was it ever in the service of said nation. Alsop also argued that the cargo of the vessel was not destined to aid the enemy in any way, but rather her husband, Captain Waterman, and his crew were good subjects of the United States of America. The case at hand was significant. Uh, for the cargo of the Frank included 91 casks of dry fish, about 40 quintals of fish loose stowed in the aft hold, about 12 casks and three barrels of oil and five barrels of herrings. In addition to the vessel itself with all its apparel, tackle, furniture and appurtenances, Mary Alsop sought the restoration of her ship and property. The facts of the case at first glance appear simple enough, all right? The Sloop Montgomery uh, commissioned private vessel took the Frank on the high seas under the rule that ships aiding the enemy were considered fair game. Mary Alsop, right, enters the picture and claims, no, 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 the Frank was property of a loyal subject of the United States and therefore not a legal prize. Yet the story of the Frank was anything but simple. When the Frank, first left the port of New London, Connecticut, the vessel was sailing under the name Dolphin and had papers to that effect. So stay with me here. So the Frank, when it first left New London, Connecticut uh, and Alsop, Richard Alsop had it set sail, uh, it was called the Dolphin, not the Frank. It was called the Dolphin and its papers uh, sailing from that port said that it was the Dolphin. Okay, Waterman was charged with commanding the vessel, the Dolphin, on a voyage to Jamaica. Down there at the bottom. All right, where he would discharge his cargo. He was then to gain a cargo of the produce of said island and then return with said schooner directly to New London and Middletown. However, while anchored at port in Jamaica, Waterman claimed he heard news of the battles of Lexington and Bunker Hill. According to his deposition, Waterman feared for the safety of his vessel and believed the dolphin would fall prey to a British vessel because he was carrying American papers. Therefore, Waterman made a decision, a decision without orders from his said owner and with intent, he said, only to save said schooner and cargo from condemnation as American property. He sold the dolphin to a local merchant in order to gain new papers 
Under these new papers, the vessel was renamed the Frank. Still with me here? Okay, so we've got Waterman sailing from New London, Connecticut on the Dolphin, reaches Jamaica. Waterman claims, uh-oh, we've heard about what's going on uh, with the British at Lexington and Bunker Hill. And if we sail back and we're stopped by, by a British ship and we have American papers, they'll take everything. So we're going to sell to a local merchant, uh, get new papers that aren't American, uh, and we'll call ourselves the Frank. All right. Waterman maintained he departed Montego Bay in Jamaica with the intent of sailing directly for New London, Connecticut. However, just as the Frank came within sight of Long Island, the crew spied an armed British sloop at anchor in the bay. The Frank changed course to avoid the enemy. An unfriendly wind, according to Waterman, caused him to change course again, this time for Newfoundland. Notice the distance between New London and Newfoundland, right? Where they arrived on October 4th, 1776. Waterman said he tried to make it to New London once more, but was thwarted this time by two British frigates. Instead, the Frank made several trips between Newfoundland and Jamaica before the Montgomery ultimately captured the vessel. Waterman's deposition ended with the captain's insistence that he had constantly endeavored in every method he thought safe to comply with his original orders and return with said schooner to New London and Middletown. The original ship's papers, which proved Alsop's ownership of the dolphin, right? Those first American papers that they had gotten in Connecticut before they set sail, those were destroyed when the vessel was chased by the said British sloop of war. Such were the facts according to Waterman. The case uh, records also contain depositions from several additional individuals presented for the court's consideration. Jeremiah Wadsworth of Hartford offered that he knew Richard Alsop well before his death and that the deceased often spoke of his ship, the Dolphin. Wadsworth also contended that Waterman, right, the captain of the Dolphin slash Frank, always bore the character of a friend to the United States of America and son of liberty, and also that of a man of inflexible integrity and truth. Nathaniel Shaler, a man from Middletown, concurred with Wadsworth's, Wadsworth's testimony. Both depositions were taken at the request of Mrs. Mary Alsop, who attempted to prove the loyalty of her captain and her husband's ownership of the vessel, right? So because the Frank does not have its original papers, it's calling it the Dolphin and showing that Richard Alsop owned it, here Mary Alsop is trying to prove, yes, Richard Alsop owned the Dolphin, right? And then she's also trying to prove that Sylvanus Waterman, her captain, was a true and loyal subject of the United States, not someone who was sailing uh, in an effort to aid Great Britain, the enemy of the United States. A sailor who joined the voyage in Montego Bay, Jamaica, gave a statement as well, which confirmed Waterman's story of sailing for New London and encountering the British enemy. The sailor claimed that he initially served aboard a different vessel owned by Richard Alsop, but transferred to the Frank in hopes of returning home sooner. And at that time, he had the understanding that the Frank, right, belonged to the same owner, Richard Alsop. So again, he's also saying, yes, Alsop owned, owns the Frank, and therefore his widow owns the Frank. Ashbel Burnham noted in his deposition that when word of Lexington and Bunker Hill arrived in Jamaica, the news alarmed the people and everyone feared any American property would be confiscated. Burnham affirmed that he encouraged Waterman to change his papers by altering the register and taking out new ones in the name of someone who was friendly to America, but not an American citizen. Burnham contended that he himself brought home a copy of the receipt to Richard Alsop. Upon these facts, that the vessel belonged to Richard Alsop and Captain Waterman was a true patriot, Mary Alsop asked for a dismissal of the libel and exoneration of the ship. All right, 
So let's recap here. Captain Thomas Ruttenberg is the captain of the privateer ship in question here, right? The Montgomery. He claims that he and his privateer crew came upon the Frank and that it was in service of an enemy of the United States, Great Britain, right? That her cargo was intended to aid the enemy. Mary Alsop, on the other hand, claims that her husband, Richard Alsop, was owner of the Frank, formerly the Dolphin, and was a loyal citizen of the United States. She also claims that her captain, Sylvanus Waterman, was a man of strong reputation and a loyal citizen. The cargo of the Frank was in no way intended to aid the enemy. The judge refused to dismiss the case, despite Mary Alsop's pleas. And so a jury was impaneled. So ladies and gentlemen, you are the jury now. If you were on the jury, how would you find? Now, I know this is a little harder because we're on Zoom, but we're going to try something here and we'll see if it works. Uh, you have the option to raise your hand. And do you know this on your like Zoom bar, whether it's on the bottom or on the top? So I'm going to ask you this. If you would vote in favor of Captain Thomas Ruttenberg in the Montgomery, the Frank is a legal prize. Uh, you believe that, you know, because Waterman was making multiple trips, that he was aiding and abetting the enemy, Great Britain. Do me a favor and raise your hand, raise your hand. I don't know if this is gonna work, we'll see. That's it, seeing people raise their hands. Hand raising, are we hand raising? Okay, uh, I'm actually, I'm not really seeing people, are, we'll, we'll just go with it. All right, uh, if you don't believe that, right? If you would vote in favor of Mary Alsop and Captain Sylvanus Waterman, right? You think the Frank belonged to a loyal citizen of the United States and was not engaged in trade with the enemy and therefore is not a legal prize to the privateer, go ahead and click your raise hand button. You know where you stand. Everybody's got their position. It was eighty. It was it was eighty six voting in favor and about seventy nine uh, against. So yeah. Thank you, Andrew. I could not see that. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So keep in mind what you decided. All right. Because I'll tell you what the jury itself decided. The jury in the case of Thomas Ruttenberg versus the Frank. The jury found that the aforesaid vessel has been employed in carrying and supplying the enemies of the United States of America, contrary to resolve, the resolves of the Congress, the laws of this state, and the laws of nations. The judge proclaimed the vessel condemned for the use of Ruttenberg and his crew and called for auction at a public venue to the highest bidder or bidders as soon as may be first giving public notice of the time and place of sale. So they found in favor of the privateer crew of Ruttenberg and his privateers. Huzzah, they took a prize. They're going to, they're going to be able to sell it. Uh, they're going to make a profit from it. They're going to divide their shares. Everyone's happy. Unless you're Mary Alsop and Sylvanus Waterman, then you're not happy, right? Uh, and so Mary Alsop, obviously displeased with the ruling, appealed the decision to the Continental Congress, right? Theodore Foster, clerk of the Rhode Island Court of Justice, compiled a packet of 19 pages containing a true copy of the case, which is um, some of those snippets that I showed you from the depositions. Those are from uh, the Revolutionary War prize cases uh, in cases of appeal. Um, he made a true copy of the case, which was submitted to the Continental Congress. The appeal was lodged with Congress on March 6, 1777, and referred to the Standing Committee on Appeals on Thursday, April 24, 1777. James Wilson, John Adams, and Thomas Burke heard the appeal and handed down their judgment on May 20th of that year. The decision of the Standing Committee of Appeals was thus, having heard and fully considered as well, all in singular, the matters and things contained and set forth in the records or minutes of the proceedings of the Court of Admiralty of Rhode Island, the committee pronounced 
that the decree of the Rhode Island court be in all its parts revoked, reversed, and annulled. The Frank, along with all its appurtenances, as well as the cargo on board at the time of capture, were to be restored and re-delivered unto Mary Alsop and Sylvanus Waterman, the claimants in the said cause. Oh my goodness, total reversal. Total, so Ruttenberg, who right a few months before had had this prize in hand with his crew celebrating, now all of a sudden, nope, it's not his anymore. It goes back to Mary Alsop and Sylvanus Waterman. To rub salt in the wound, Ruttenberg had to pay Alsop and Waterman for their costs and charges expended by them in sustaining and supporting their said appeal, a cost of $95. Thomas Ruttenberg and the crew, owners and outfitters of the privateer Montgomery lost their hard earned prize in this case of appeal. Ruttenberg had no further recourse. The decision of the standing committee was final. Thus, a venture which seemed fruitful a year earlier turned out for naught. In fact, the crews operated at a $95 loss because they had to pay the court costs. <laughs> Privateers ran such risk with every voyage they undertook. The crew did not receive any prize money. The owners did not receive any return on their investment. Even if a privateer voyage resulted in a prize in port, that did not automatically convert into prize money, as this case illustrates. In the world of privateers, there were no guarantees, not even in theory. Some of these cases lasted long after the final shots were fired at Yorktown, leaving privateers in, in what was often deemed an unpatriotic position. Despite the risks they took on behalf of the American cause, privateers came to be viewed as profiteers more often than not and were still in the eyes of many as pirates. Though, as we know, because I know you were paying attention at the beginning, that's not quite correct, right, is it? Perhaps even worse, as was the case with the Montgomery and the Frank, privateers often attacked their fellow Americans by claiming they were aiding and abetting the enemy, Great Britain. Mary Alsop, in turn, shows us how she had to defend her husband and her ship's captain against such allegations and prove their loyalty to the patriotic cause. Privateer ventures thus pitted American against American in a struggle already fraught with internal tensions. It then is perhaps no surprise that by the end of the war, privateers were perceived as unworthy of the revolutionary legacy. John Paul Jones, captain in the Continental Navy, expressed this view best when he wrote, public virtue is not the characteristic of the concerned in privateers. The common class of mankind are actuated by no nobler principle than that of self-interest. This and only this determines all adventurers and privateers, the owners as well as those whom they employ. Even George Washington, a supporter of privateer ventures initially, noted our rascally privateersmen go on at the old rate, mutinying if they cannot do as they please. Privateers were inconsistent and disloyal, according to this commander in chief. Their ultimate goal was to look out for themselves rather than fight for the American cause. They were men who had specifically joined the war effort in their own effort to win big. But privateers aided in that effort. Without a doubt, they took the war directly to Britain long before the Continental Navy could or would. Their status as combatants should not be questioned, and yet it oftentimes is, or it's just completely dismissed and forgotten. The shady reputations they had gained as the colony's most effective form of waterborne warfare came with a price. That fashion through which they had helped achieve victory made them a necessary commemorative afterthought in the post-war period. They faced collective judgment from their government, their champions and their foes, their European allies and enemies, and their passengers and peers. In the end, the presence of these ultimate rebels was unwelcome 
as the rebellion's legacy was reshaped into the story of a successful revolution. A story which focused on Washington crossing the Delaware, the Battle of Saratoga, right? The turning point of the war, every history teacher tells you in high school, uh, the serendipitous arrival of the French and Cornwallis's surrender at Yorktown. A war which focused on profit as well as patriotism and other motivating factors, a war that supposedly siphoned men from more worthwhile and legitimate forces of the Continental Navy and Army, a war such as that waged by privateers was an ugly and unwelcome legacy. While the fight for liberty and independence supposedly perpetuated by Washington and other patriots was a glorious cause. Privateer experiences made them different from the Continental Navy and Army in some ways. They had instructions to be sure, though they did not always follow the rules. Profit could and did override patriotism for some. Their payment system was public and messy at times, as we've just seen. Moreover, the wartime records of privateers threatened post-war efforts towards diplomacy and international trade. How could the newly minted US government repair trade relations with Great Britain if those pesky pirates, as the British called them, were being touted as heroes. The exploits of privateers also exposed the reputations of the founders, admittedly self-interested men, some of whom actually invested in privateers during the war, right? To a higher degree of scrutiny than the elite overseers of the revolution story deemed acceptable. Yet, as the untold war at sea illustrates, privateers are an integral part of the American Revolution. They are combatants worthy of study and scholarship. In stretching the boundaries of that combatant status to include privateers, we stretch the boundaries of the revolution, geographically and socially. Their story is part of the American story. Knowing their story now, we cannot go back. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holbert, for that very interesting uh, presentation. I am going to uh, open up the floor for some questions now. Um, so the first thing I would like to ask you is, I know <clears throat> your dissertation also focused on privateers. What, what drew you, what was the motivation uh, behind your interest in researching and writing about privateers uh, during the Revolutionary War? Sure. So um, I did my undergraduate work at William and Mary, uh, and I loved. I fell in love with Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, I, I had dreams of being the wig maker at one point. Uh, obviously, that that did not pan out. Um, but I, I I loved the Colonial and Revolutionary period. So when I I got to graduate school. Uh, I actually didn't have a topic in mind, unlike many of my other uh, colleagues uh, at the time. And I was a little concerned. And then I took an Atlantic World Seminar. And it was in this seminar uh, that my professor, Benjamin Ehlers, said, well, look for, look for sources that people haven't talked about before. And I came upon the papers of Gustavus Cunningham. Uh, and it just opened, opened the window, opened the floodgates, really, for me. Uh, and I started looking and trying to find well, who's written about privateers. And you know, William Bell Clark has Ben Franklin's privateers. Um, Patton has written, you know, Patriot Pirates was a, a, a more popular uh, survey of, of privateer actions. But other than that, there really weren't uh, writings or scholarship that focused on privateers. And the more I dug into it, uh, the more I realized that there was a, a real story to be told here, uh, a story about privateer efforts, about their actions, about their experiences, um, and a story that we don't really discuss, or at least I had never discussed in any of my history classes. Fascinating. Yeah, it, I mean, it is an untouched uh, topic and subject of the Revolutionary War. So, um as we said earlier, hopefully this will uh, encourage more to, uh, to dive into the subject. So thank you. Um, now, the one question that we did have um, was where did the colonies obtain naval guns to outfit their privateers, especially uh, after 1775? Um, so some of them uh, are, some of 
privateering was a way of life throughout the 18th century. So when privateering, when the Continental Congress decided to commission privateers, they were already building upon a longstanding tradition. So there are um, gun, there are ships that are kind of already either outfitted for or, or have operated as privateers in the past. Um, and then obviously we also, this becomes actually a point of contention uh, with the Continental Navy because the Continental Navy is also trying to outfit their ships with not only men, but guns, uh, and there's not enough for both. And so privateers, oftentimes uh, their investors are able to pay more uh, to get guns, right? And guns are taken, uh, they're captured from the British at times, right? They, they're they captured from ships as they come in. Uh, we know at Fort Ticonderoga, right? They, they bring, uh, they take the guns and bring them back. Um, and so this then be actually can becomes an issue with privateers because there are those who say, well, we can't man an outfit a Navy uh, because the privateers are taking all, all of our equipment and all of our men, right? Uh, and so they're, they're basically taking, taking them from maybe where they shouldn't be taking them, depending on your point of view, right? I mean, there's, I, I would argue, well, they're taking them, but they're actually getting out there like 1775 privateers are, are in the Atlantic already. And the Continental Navy hasn't even been formed because John Adams is sitting in, con in the Continental Congress like spitting on people saying, we need a Navy. Um, and nobody's listening to him. <laughs> right, so. Make, makes sense. And that's a, that's a good uh, segue into another question that was posed. Um, Congress throughout the, the Revolutionary War authorized 525 ships um, and they were, Today, they're often known as the militia at sea. Um, did What was the relationship? I know there was some animosity, but did they ever work together? Uh, did, did the Navy pro provide protection for these privateers? Um, you know, how, how did that work out? So there are, um, the Penobscot expedition is actually the one kind of like big example where privateers actually did sail in tandem uh, with the Navy. The problem with that though, is that the privateers actually leave before the expedition is done. Uh, and then they they get this um, legacy, uh, you know, moniker attached to them that they're untrustworthy and that you can't sail with them uh, because they, they're, they're only interested in themselves. Um, so there isn't a lot of uh, cooperation between uh, the Navy and privateers. But that's not to say that they didn't encounter one another on the seas. Uh, oftentimes they hail one another. Um, ships uh, uh, oftentimes use deception. They're flying, especially privateers, they don't want to fly their real flag until they find out who it is that they're approaching. Um, and so, and especially in the Caribbean, um, they, they encounter one another. Uh, there are examples of privateers sailing together, right? They, they basically form a, a convoy and they say, oh, well, we sail together. We sailed together for a few days in hopes of, of claiming a prize together, of finding a prize. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And then, you know, they, they go their separate ways. Um, but I don't know that there was any real like concerted effort other than the Penobscot expedition for them to, to have, you know, joint uh, expeditions or joint ventures. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, did privateers uh, have over the long term? Did they have long term effect on British strategy at sea? Um, did the did the British Navy adapt in any way to to counter these privateers? Yes. So um, we so insurance rates go through the roof. Uh, as American privateers uh, set sail into the waters of the Atlantic and, and the Caribbean. Um, it becomes increasingly more expensive for British merchant vessels to sail uh, because American privateers are, are, are taking them and are attacking them. Uh, there, is an, there are calls in London uh, for um, greater protection for merchant vessels. Uh, but the problem is the British are like, well, we don't, we have our Navy, but we are also trying to use our Navy to fight a war in the colonies. Uh, and then also to protect our interests in European waters. And now you're trying to tell us that we also need to protect 
merchant vessel. So in a sense, right, it becomes um, like they're, they're trying to slice, make too many slices in, in the pie uh, of protection. And so uh, we, there is evidence that um, merchants stop sending, you know, ships out um, be, and because it becomes so expensive uh, to, to ship things that they, that they, they make adjustments in that way in terms of uh, their, their merchanting trade. Gotcha. Okay. Um, now sticking to the British side of things, there's a couple questions. Did the British employ par privateers at all? Yes. Okay. Yes. There are British privateers. I will say that my book does not focus on British privateers because honestly, they could fill up uh, a book all of their own. Uh, but the British employ privateers as well. Privateering was a long standing uh, practice for um, European powers uh, in the 18th century and, and before. Uh, Elizabeth I, Queen Elizabeth I in the 1500s is, is actually the first to employ privateers because she doesn't have the funds to create uh, a Royal Navy uh, at first. And so like when she sends Francis Drake off, I mean, technically in some ways he's he's a privateer. Um, some, well, some of his voyages she openly uh, you know, avows and then others she secretly does because she doesn't want the Spanish to know that she's supporting him. But um, privateering is is used then in, in Queen's, Queen Anne's War. It's used in the War of Jenkins' Ear. It's used in um, the Seven Years' War, French and Indian War. And so colonists uh, during the 1700s who participate in some of those conflicts are also uh, utilizing privateers. So it is certainly a a British practice, and then by extension, it becomes an American practice. Gotcha. Understood. Okay. Um, now there was a, a question. Um, it was it, it was posed as as follows: uh, Privateering um, is often thought of, it, it is thought of it as pri uh, piracy, if not undertaken by a, so a recognized sovereign nation. Uh, the U.S. isn't recognized until at least 1778, uh, when, once they were officially recognized by the French. French, uh, French. Yep. Um, they, did the U.S. finally uh, see an increase in numbers of men coming out for, uh, to participate as privateers, or did, did that have any effect? Was it, you know, a small number and then it just blew up, you know, once they thought it would be different or? Not that I not that I know, like not that I've seen in the in the archives. I mean, men were interested in privateering from the get go. Uh, there were actually some men who took to like Washington, actually his like flotilla, which may or may not have been privateers. They're not commissioned. So like, eh, it's a gray area because they don't actually have a commission. But like he sends ships out before the Continental Congress even commissions privateers. Uh, and so as, as soon as the Continental Congress uh, draws up the blank commissions and sends them out. I mean, there are governors who are writing back and forth to one another saying, hey, do you have more blank commissions? Because I need more blank commissions because I've got more ships that want to set sail and I don't have any more commissions. I mean, so 1776, as soon as that happens, I mean, they are, they are out there and they are prepared. I don't know that there's any um, noticeable like increase or influx just because we're like officially recognized. Sure. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, talking about the, you were talking a little bit about the commissions uh, and, or the letters of Mark. Um, how long were these valid for? Did they ever have to be renewed or were, were they just good for, for life? So it, de it depends, right? Um, if like your, if your ownership changes, if your tonnage changes, if the number of guns that you're carrying changes, right? You, um, you had to be like up to date, uh, your bond had to be up to date. So right, the, the money that you kind of like, that your investors put forward basically saying on good faith that, that you were going to be, you were going to be a good privateer who followed your instructions and did what you were supposed to do. Um, but there are also times when uh, new commissions are given because a vessel will go out, will voyage for like six months and will come back. And the three men who were, you know, outfitting it decide, one of them decides that well, I, I got my money's worth and I'm leaving and a new guy comes in. And because that new guy has come in, then they need to like update the commission. Um, oftentimes also too, which makes it very uh, challenging sometimes for the researcher is that we have ships that go out uh, under one name, come back, change their name, get a new commission, go out, come back, 
change their name, get a new commission. So it's the same ship that's going out on multiple voyages, but because it has different names each time, it makes it seem like it's a, a different ship. So then you kind of have to look through and be like, oh, these same three men are outfitting it. It's just called, you know, the the revenge instead of the, uh, I don't know, the bumblebee or that would probably wouldn't be a good name for a privateer ship, but yeah. Maybe, you yeah. never know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, who judged these prizes and, and what constituted a good prize? Uh, captains, captains and their crews. Uh, a good prize had a full cargo hold, right? There are instances in logbooks where uh, privateers will will hail a ship or, or encounter a vessel and board it. And they'll go into the hold and they'll be like, oh, this isn't worth it. It's not because what privateers oftentimes had to do uh, in order to bring that prize to port is they had to put a prize crew on that ship. So they would have to take a contingent of their men. So let's say that they had a crew of, I don't know, 40 men, and they'd have to take at least five or 10 and put that prize crew on the vessel. Oh, yes. Fear the bumblebee. Thank you. Thank you, William. Um, I like it. Uh, so, but they would have to take men from their ship and put it on the prize so that the prize, so that then their men could sail the prize into port so that it could be liable, you know, claimed at the court of admiralty. So it had to be worth your while, right? It, there, there had to be um, enough in, within the cargo hold that you felt like you, you could sell it and get a profit for it. Um, there are instances, I've seen instances where sometimes the privateer will take take what's in the cargo hold and then just let the ship go because they don't feel like it's worth it trying to bring the ship in. Um, and then there are other times when they come upon a ship and, and it's actually already been emptied by another privateer. And they're like, oh, well, man. And they just say, go, leave. You're, you're not worth, you're not worth the time. You're not you're not worth it for us. Um, so it was really up to the captain and his officers to determine whether or not uh, a prize was worth their time and effort. Gotcha. Okay. And that leads into another question uh, relating to prizes. Uh, were there prize ports outside of the 13 colonies, like in France, the Netherlands, or Spain? So this also becomes a point of contention uh, in European waters. Yes, the, the French and the Spanish do accept uh, prizes in their ports. However, they have to be taken legally, right? They basically, it's like it has, the letter of the law has to be followed. So Cunningham, for example, is one privateer uh, who ends up taking a vessel of a neutral nation. He takes a Swedish brig and he tries to bring it into France. And the French are like, dude, you can't do this, right? Like this, this is, this is against the laws of Nate, like the law of nations. Um, you're going to get us in trouble. Uh, and also the French, uh, right before 1778, are not openly at war with the British. So it's all kind of like done secretly, clandestinely. They're trying not to draw attention to it, but they are allowing American privateers into their ports. So absolutely, um, they are brought into port. Benjamin Franklin who is one of the commissioners in France and Silas Dean, also a commissioner in France. Uh, they are trying to help privateers. Uh, Franklin himself uh, writes some of the commissions, signs some of the commissions for privateers uh, operating out of France. So yes, there are, there are certainly ports outside of the 13 colonies that privateers can utilize, but they have to be careful in how they do so. Okay, and then that again leads into another question: uh, Did did uh, American privateers prey on other nations? Um, act, you know, intentionally, accidentally. Uh, you know, it it seems a little bit of uh, muddy so, water. <laughs> yes, and it is, uh, and this is one of the reasons I argue in the book why they are kind of left out of that like triumphant revolutionary narrative that we have written for ourselves. Uh, because we like to think of ourselves as, as liberty and, and independence and, um, you know, doing what is right, when in reality, there are privateers who were operating for self-interest. Um, and that doesn't have to be ugly or, or uh, you know, dirty in a sense, um, because it's just it's just what it was it's 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 how they 
made a return on the money that they were putting into privateering. But yes, there are privateers uh, who go after neutral vessels. Oftentimes what they'll do is they'll say, well, the vessel is neutral, but its cargo belongs to a British citizen. Or um, it, has, it, it was aiding the British enemy. It's carrying this to the British to help them. And so that is that there's there's all these ways that privateers try to like spin the story to make it seem like, you know, they, they took a vessel um, or they'll there are also uh, instances in the court cases where they'll say, well, the vessel has false papers. Right. The vessel isn't actually a Portuguese vessel. It's a British vessel. Uh, they doctored their papers or uh, so many times I've seen in the log books they, you know, we took a prize, but before we could board it, they threw all their papers overboard. And so we've lost all their papers. So we don't actually know whether it's a British ship or not. So we're bringing it into port because we hope that it's a British ship. Like we think it is because they threw their papers overboard. Because if it wasn't a British ship, why would they throw all their papers overboard kind of thing? Um, but yes, there there are privateers who looking for that profit and that big payoff, you know, aren't just going after like solely British merchant ships. Um, they're, they're going after whatever they can take and, you know, fingers crossed that that ends up being profitable for them. Okay. Understood. Uh, now the million dollar question uh, that <laughs> a lot of people are asking. Oh no. The statistics <laughs> up behind it all. Um, okay. What was an estimated number of tonnage taken uh how many british ships you know no these so um best estimates guesstimates in a sense almost so uh there are several um masters some other scholars who have done more of the quantitative work on this and looking at it there is the numbers range uh somewhere between 1,200 to over 3,000 American privateer vessels set sail. Uh, at least 600 British vessels are taken during the revolution, at least. Now the question becomes how many of them actually make it to a prize court because there are vessels that are taken that are then retaken by the British right and then are never at, like are considered a prize but never never actually make it to port um tonnage uh that i don't know that we can even calculate i mean i don't even know that that's like calculable based on i mean i guess i guess if i really sat down with all my sources i could i could try to figure that out uh but i mean the average the average prize could bring in $45,000 i mean if if you're talking about like if it had a full cargo hold and if you sold the ship, it's tackle, it's furniture. It's like, if you basically sold everything down to the studs, um, you could make a, a solid profit. Gotcha. Well, I guess that's the closest we're going to get. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And I'm, I'm sure people are sitting there going like this. That's not a good answer. Um, and I just saw Howard's point about a spreadsheet. Howard, you're absolutely right. Um, and my dad, who uh, was in banking, loves spreadsheets. And I have tried to like figure it out. But but the problem is that we don't have all those records necessarily. Right. Like we there are times when um, there'll be like a newspaper article that basically says, you know, the Montgomery took the Frank, a British sloop of war, whatever. And it's like, oh, that's great. What was in it, right? Like, what, what did it bring in? Um, and then we don't know. All we know is that it, it, the vessel was taken. So that's frustrating. I mean, it's frustrating for me as a scholar also that there, there are just answers that we might not, at least I, I won't, right, have the definitive answers. But perhaps someone who is more quantitatively minded will, will take that and run with that for their dissertation. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Holbert, I think that is a great place to uh, wrap things up. And I want to thank you again for your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, going off the amount of people who registered for this and the amount of people who attended, it is obviously a very hot topic. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your comments and questions. <laughs> I also uh, hope this offers a little bit of incentive for people to go out and uh, purchase the book right here. And there, uh, <laughs> there actually was a question. Uh, is this available as an ebook? It uh, is. Yes. Okay. It's available. Go to a Amazon. A Amazon. 
There you go. And it's available as an ebook on Amazon. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, awesome. Now, before we officially conclude tonight's program, I'd like to point out that as you all leave tonight, a Google form survey will appear on your screen. We kindly ask that you share your thoughts about tonight's program, as well as any other suggestions uh, for any other topics that you would like us to cover in future programs. As always, your feedback is helpful and much appreciated as we develop our future programming calendar. With that, I would also like to invite you to visit the events page on our website, www.americanrevolutioninstitute.org, where you can learn more about our upcoming historical programs. Uh, our next one is a virtual lunch bite that will be held on Zoom February 11th at 1230 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and will feature a presentation on a very unique German military Jaeger rifle. So with that, on behalf of the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening and for your continued support of our mission. I wish you all a great evening and until next time, take care and good night.